right, we are on Facebook. And we do a few more steps. Turn on the original sound. Video will not go on. Check. Second. second we're trying to reset the video here Give me a second, this video. I have to use my alternative video. Okay, we'll have to use the alternative video. So much for that. Okay, we're gonna, here we go, alternative video key jar. So, uh, Jaya Radha Madhava Kunda Bihari Jaya Radha Madhava Kunda Bihari Gopi Jana Ballava Giri Bharadhaji Gopi 
Janabalapa Giddy Bonnard Hahuti Yashodananda Brata Jana Ranjanta Yasho Then Handana Brata Jana Ranjanta Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Anachari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunjabi Hari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunjabi Hari Gopi Janab Malaba Giri Varadha Hudi Gopi Janab Malaba Giri Varadha Hudi Yashoda Dandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Vanachari Yamuna Tira Vanachari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunjabi Hari Va Kunjabi Jai Om Vishnupad Paramahamsa Paravidakacharya All Sutera Satishi Shimad His Divine Grace Abhaya Charana Ravaktavananda Gosami Shila Prabhupada Kichai Iskan Founder Acharya Shila Prabhupada Kichai Ananda Goti Vaishnava Vrindikijai Namacharya Shila Hrida Stakur Kichai Parem Sekaho Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shidwaita Gadadha Shiva Siddhigor Vakta Vrindikijai Shri Shri Radha Krishna Gopi Gopinath Shyam Kun Radha Gunda Giri Govardhan Kijai Vrindavanam Kijai Maturam Kijai Jagadatha Sami Kijai Yuvanamai Kijai Shimadhi Lassi Devi Kijai Samaveda Bhakta Vrindi Kijai Gora Premananda Hari Hari Bo All glories the assembled devotees All glories the assembled devotees All glories the assembled devotees all glories to Shri Guru and Gauranga Shila Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Premananda Hari Hari Gaur. So, Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimadhi Bhakti Vedanta Swamana Namane Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pacharani Nivashesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Dejatarani. So, Om Agana Timiranda Shah Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Udmiditam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. All right, go back to the other camera. So I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, who so kindly opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge while I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So we're going to continue with our study of the nectar. Of devotion and we're talking now again about impetuses for ecstatic devotion or ecstatic love but based upon servitude okay and before that before we begin I just want to make one announcement and which I'll make also at the end of this class is that tomorrow we're gonna to start just for tomorrow not any other day we're going to start a half hour early because we have a special dance performance that's going to be online and it's not going to be me dancing so don't worry about that it's going to be a dance play performance of the lalita madhava and that's going to be live from nukaloka in front of the deities at uh half hour earlier than today's class. Now, also, uh, it's also going to be done live uh, on 
let's see, Saturday, our time, you know, U.S. time Saturday at uh, 11 o'clock in the morning, but that's not going to be good for anybody. Anybody in Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, it's a terrible time, so don't even think of tuning in at that time. This is going to be the first performance. It's going to be tomorrow. It's going to be the first performance, or tonight. Yeah, it'll be tomorrow. That's right. Tomorrow will be the first performance of the Lita Madhava, the entire Lita Madhava. It's going to take about an hour and a half to two hours, starting at half hour earlier than we're starting tonight. And that's going to be just tomorrow, tomorrow. Whatever time you're all tuning in, it's just a half an hour earlier, and it's going to go for two hours instead of the class. It's going to be the Lita Madhava, a play by Srila Rupa Goswami done by a group of very expert dancers and dramatists. And it'll be very exciting. So it's a perfect timing for those of you in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji. And I guess it's timing good for everybody in, uh, everybody in, where else? Everybody in the United States, and, but not for people in Europe. So there are going to be two performances. Anyway, it's going to be not, I guess I will put it on uh, Zoom. No, actually, I think I'll, we may just put it on my Facebook page because there's no need of Zoom. It's not going to be interactive. So, but I may put it on uh, Zoom too, just for just for the sake of everybody here who might tune in on on Zoom. Okay, so now we're going to go on to the nectar of devotion. We're going to share our screen, and we're continuing to read about. Hold on a second. Move this out so I can see the whole screen. We continue to read about impetuses for Krishna's. So in the Skanda Purana, a dear Lord, as the sun evaporates all the water on the ground by its scorching heat, so my mental state has dried away the luster of my face and body due to separation from you. This is an example of withering in ecstatic love. And of course, that appears to be a Vyavachari Bhava. An expression of disappointment was made by Indra, the king of heaven, when he saw the sun god. Indra told him, my dear sun god, your sunshine is very glorious because it reaches unto the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, the master of the Yadu dynasty. I have thousands of eyes, but they've proved to be useless because not even for a moment are they able to see the lotus feet of the Lord. Reverential devotion for the Lord gradually increases and transforms itself into ecstatic love, then affection, and then attachment. In the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 38th chapter, verse 6, Akrura says, Because I am going to see Lord Krishna today, all my symptoms of inauspiciousness have already been killed. My life is now successful because I shall be able to offer my respects unto the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Another devotee in ecstatic reverential affection once said, when will I, that glorious day in my life come when it will be possible for me to go to the bank of the Yamuna and see Lord Sri Krishna playing there as a coward boy. When there is no diminishing of this ecstatic love, and when it is freed from all kinds of doubt, the devotee has reached the stage called steady love for Krishna. In this stage, all expressions of unhappiness by the devotee are called anubhava, or ecstatic loving symptoms. Remember what we talked about with anubhava? Anubhava means the symptoms that a devotee voluntarily expresses. That is when they're on the steady platform, that's what it means when it says no diminishing of this ecstatic love, freed from all kinds of doubt, that's called steady love for Krishna, and even unhappiness is an ecstatic loving symptom. Pretty good. The symptom of ecstatic affection with reverence felt by Bali Maharaj was expressed as follows. My dear Lord, you have simultaneously punished me and shown me your causeless mercy. My conclusion is 
that when I have taken shelter of your lotus feet, I shall never be disturbed in any condition of life. Whether you give me the opportunity to enjoy all the yogic perfections or put me into the most abominable condition of hellish life, I shall never be disturbed. And this is an actually interesting statement because it reflects the position of a pure devotee. A pure devotee prays, I can go to heaven or hell, I can take birth in whatever type of life as long as I'm your servant. Bhaktivinoda Thakur also prays, you know, Kita Jan Mahoya that I am willing to take birth as a worm or an insect, as long as the insect or worm is your devotee and in the house and associated with devotees. So that's pure devotional service. A pure devotee does not aspire after liberation. Krishna himself, after seeing Bali Maharaj, told Uddhava, my dear friend, how can I express the glorious characteristics of Bali Maharaj, the son of Vrinochan? Hmm. Although the king of the Suras, demigods, was cursed by this son of Virochan, and although I cheated him in my incarnation as Vamana, taking away his dominions throughout the universe, and although I still criticized him for not fulfilling his promise, I have just now seen him in his kingdom, and he feelingly expressed his love to me. So that's the story of Bali Maharaj, which we told, I think, very quickly the other day. That is... He, he was the demon family, grandson of Pallad Maharaj, took away everything from the demons, from the demigods, sorry, took over the demigods' kingdom, and therefore the demigods prayed for a kid who can take the kingdom back. That kid became the son of Aditi, the mother of all the demigods, and that kid was an incarnation of Krishna called Lord Vamanadev, the dwarf Brahman. And Lord Vamanadev went to Bali Maharaj's sacrificial performance, begged for some charity. Bali Maharaj said, you can have whatever you want. Uh, Vamana Dave said, I only want three steps of land. Bali Maharaj said, that's not so intelligent. You can have anything. Uh, Vamana said, if I'm not satisfied with three steps of land, I'll never be satisfied with anything. And then Bali Maharaj said, okay, I'll give you three steps of land. Of course, his guru tried to interfere with it. But he uh, signified he was going to give the three steps of land. He promised and Vamana Dev took one step over the whole Earth planet, second step covered the universe, poked a hole in the universe, and there was nowhere to put the third step, so he put it on Bali Maharaj's head and pushed him down to the lower regions of the universe. And in spite of that, Bali Maharaj actually had great love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When such a feeling of love becomes intensified, it is called affection. In that affectional stage, one cannot bear about that in the next chapter. One devotee, my dear Daruka, hmm, when you become like wood because of your separation from Krishna, I mean stunned, uh, it is not so wonderful. Whenever any devotee sees Krishna, his eyes become filled with water and in separation, any devotee like you would become stunned, standing just like a wooden doll. That is not a very wonderful thing. There is a statement about Uddhava's symptoms of love. When he saw Lord Krishna, his eyes filled with tears and created a river which flowed down toward the sea of Krishna to offer tribute as a wife offers tribute to her husband. When his body erupted with goose pimples, he appeared like the Kadamba flower. And when he began to offer prayers, he appeared completely distinct from all other devotees. When affection is symptomized by direct happiness and distress, it is called attraction. <laughs> In such an attracted state of ecstatic love, one can face all kinds of disadvantages calmly. And the perfect example is Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was, let me turn off this phone because it keeps beep, 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 beep. Second. Beep, beep. And one other thing I have to do to turn this off.
to here yeah, we're talking about Prabhupada because Prabhupada was subjected to so many difficulties and disadvantages you know things were taken away from him went bankrupt his wife didn't want him to preach uh, so many problems heart attacks on the boat coming over but he was never distracted because he was always one pointed trying to fulfill the order of his spiritual master who is Krishna. Even at the risk of death, such a devotee is never bereft of the transcendental loving service of the Lord. That's Prabhupada. A glorious example of this ecstatic love was exhibited by King Pariksit when he was at the point of death. Although he was bereft of his entire kingdom, which was spread all over the world, and although he was accepting not even a drop of water in the seven days remaining to him, because he was engaged in hearing the transcendental pastimes of the Lord from Shukadev Goswami, he was not in the least distressed. On the contrary, he was feeling direct transcendental ecstatic joy in association with Shukadev Goswami. So, of course, the story of Maharaj Pariksit, for those of you who don't know it, which I assume just about everybody does know it, was that once upon a time, Maharaj Pariksit was out in the forest practicing his martial arts, and he was very thirsty. And he came upon the ashram of this Samakarishi. And he saw that Samakarishi was in meditation. And because he was in meditation, he didn't offer Maharaj Pariksit anything to drink. Maharaj Pariksit got angry with him, put a snake around the sage's neck, and walked away. Meantime, the sage's son, Shringi, came in, saw his father with a snake around his neck, understood it was the king, and he cursed the king to die in seven days from the bite of a snake bird. And when Maharaj Pariksit heard this, instead of feeling, oh my God, or trying to mm, enact some remedial measure, what did he do? He said, benediction. It's a benediction knowing when you're going to die. Wow. That's pretty interesting. Because most people, if they're told you're going to die, they'll cry and cry and cry and beg for more time. They'll go to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, just a few more months. But he just said, no, this is actually a benediction. And that's like the story of Maharaj Katvanka, who was told he was going to die in an instant. And he immediately took shelter of Krishna. So Maharaj Pariksit, what he was determined to do was to hear from the Srimad Bhagavatam or hear the Bhagavatam for seven days from Shukadeva Goswami. So he went to where the sages were and he listened to the Srimad Bhagavatam from Shukadeva Goswami and he didn't drink or eat or sleep for seven days and he was completely ecstatic. And the Srimad Bhagavatam is based upon that particular conversation or class by Shukadeva Goswami to Maharaj Pariksit. And they were both feeling such ecstasy, there was no question of eating or sleeping or doing anything except for hearing and chanting about Krishna because one's consciousness becomes immediately transferred to the spiritual realm and one's body becomes spiritualized. How can one do that? Well, if you have a spiritualized body, you can do it. If you have a material body, you can't do it. A short amount of time. I was asked by a devotee if I wanted to attend this particular seminar that was going to be three hours a day, every Saturday. And it's a topic that I like to learn or, uh, learn or hear about. And I said, no, three hours on the internet looking on a computer. Too much. You imagine three hours compared to Seven days, 24 hours a day. <laughs> anyway, but it wasn't Krishna Kata, so it was a little bit different. One devotee has confidently expressed this opinion. If a drop of Lord Krishna's mercy can be bestowed upon me, then I shall feel completely carefree, even in the midst of a fire and ocean. But if I become bereft of his causeless mercy, then even if I became the king of Dwarka, I would simply be an object for pinpricks. So this shows a devotee's determination that what's the use of anything if I cannot serve Krishna and cannot be a recipient of Krishna's mercy. 
Kabodi, such as Maharaj, Pradikshit, Nudava are all situated in ecstatic attraction on the basis of affection. And that state of affection, a feeling of friendship, becomes manifest. When Uddhava was freed from all material contamination, he saw the Lord and his throat became choked up and he could not speak. By the movements of his eyebrows alone, he was embracing the Lord. Such ecstatic love has been divided in by great scholars into two groups, addition and subtraction. If a devotee is not directly associated with the Lord, it is called subtraction. In this state of love, one is constantly fixed with his mind at the lotus feet of the Lord. A devotee in this state becomes very eager to learn of the transcendental qualities of the Lord. The most important business of such a devotee is attaining the association of the Lord, the subtraction. And of course, addition uh, means to be associated with the Lord. And then the Shringa Purana, there's a statement about King Ikshvaku, which illustrates the state of ecstatic love. Because of his great affection for Krishna, King Ikshvaku became greatly attached to the black cloud, the black deer, the deer's black eyes, and the lotus flowers, which is always compared, lotus flower, which is always compared to the eyes of the Lord. In the 10th canto, 38th chapter, verse 10 of the Bhagavatam, Akrura thinks, since the Lord has now appeared to diminish the great burden of the world and is now visible to everyone's eyes in his personal transcendental body, when we see him before us, is that not the ultimate perfection of our eyes? In other words, Akrura realized that the perfection of the eyes is fulfilled when one is able to see Lord Krishna. Therefore, Lord Krishna was visible on the earth by direct appearance. Anyone who saw him surely attained perfection of sight. In the Krishna Karnamrita, written by Bilva Mangal Thakur, there is the expression of eagerness and ecstatic love. How miserable it is, my dear Krishna, O friend of the hopeless. O merciful Lord, how can I pass these thankless days without seeing you? A similar sentiment was expressed by Uddhava when he wrote a letter to Krishna and said, My dear Supreme King of Braja, you are the vision of nectar for the eyes, and without seeing your lotus feet and the effulgence of your body, my mind is always morose. I cannot perceive any peace under any circumstance. Besides that, I am feeling every moment's separation to be like the duration of many long years. In the Krishna Karnamrita, it is also said, My dear Lord, you are the ocean of mercy. With my arms placed upon my head, I am bowing down before you with all humility and sincerity. I am praying unto you, my Lord. Would you be pleased just to sprinkle a little water of your glance upon me? That will be a great satisfaction. A devotee of Lord Krishna said, When even uh, Sashi Shekara, Lord Shiva, is unable to see you, what chance is there for me, who am lower than an ordinary worm? I have only committed misdeeds. I know that I am not at all fit to offer my prayers to you. But because you are known as Dina Ondu, the friend of the fallen, I humbly pray that you will kindly purify me by the beams of your transcendental glance. If I become thoroughly bathed by your merciful glance, then I may be saved. Therefore, my Lord, I am requesting you to please bestow upon me your merciful glance. And then we're going to the next chapter. Indifference and Separation. A very, very interesting chapter. Let's just see how long this one is. I don't think it's that long. No, it's a very short chapter. Okay, everybody ready? Uh, the great My dear Krishna philosophical books and Vedic verses about the goal of life. And so now I have a little reputation for my studies. But since, in spite of my reputation, my knowledge is condemned, because although enjoying the effulgence of Vedic knowledge, I could not appreciate the effulgence emanating from the nails of your toes. Therefore, the sooner my pride and Vedic knowledge are finished, the better it will be. This is an example of indifference. 
and also lamentation too. Another devotee very anxiously expressed himself thus, my mind is very flickery, so I cannot concentrate it upon your lotus feet. Hmm. And seeing this inefficiency in myself, I become ashamed, and the whole night I am unable to sleep because I am exasperated by my great inability. Wow. This is also, you know, separation, lamentation, uh, shame, all these different emotions are just like rolled into one. In the Krishna Karnamrita, Dovamanga of Thakur has explained his restlessness as follows. My dear Lord, your naughtiness in boyhood is the most wonderful thing in the three worlds, and you yourself know what this naughtiness is. As such, you can very easily understand my flickering mind. This is known to you and me. Therefore, I am simply yearning to know how I can fix my mind on your lotus feet. And this is also instructive for us, uh, those of us who are having trouble controlling our minds. And that's really a trouble just about everybody has. As Arjuna says to Krishna in the Gita, the sixth chapter, Chanchala Himanaha Krishna Pramati Bhagavad Vidam. Tashaham nigraham manye by all ila shibhuskaram because the mind is restless, turbulent, obstinate, very strong, O Krishna, and to subdue it is more difficult than controlling the wind. So we should lament like that and pray to Krishna. As we're chanting our japa, this is actually really important, as we're chanting our japa, we should be lamenting each time our mind flies off in thousands of different directions. And if we lament like that, that will be an impetus to pray to Krishna to please give us the strength, help us fix our mind on his lotus feet, pull our mind back from wherever it wanders. So this uh, lamentation, uh, this even sadness can help us actually become more Krishna conscious. Another devotee expressed his impudence by saying, my dear Lord, Without considering my lowly position, I must confess to you that my eyes are just like black wasps desiring to hover at your lotus feet. In the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, fourth chapter, verse 37, the great sage Narada informs Maharaj Yudhisthira about Pallad Maharaj, who is a devotee from the very beginning of his life. The proof of Pallad's natural devotion is that even when he was a small child, he did not play with his playmates who was always eager to preach the glories of the Lord. Instead of joining in their sportive acrobatic feats, he remained an inactive child because he was always in trance, meditating on Krishna. As such, there was no possibility of his being touched by the external world. And this is a very special devotee. Let me just adjust something here. Balad was a very, very special devotee. We should understand that. And also understand that we should not impose this type of behavior on other children. You know, I know that sometimes parents in the Krishna conscious movement think, oh, my little son is like Pallad Maharaj. He should not be interested in any fun thing in this world. I'm not going to let him do any fun thing because he's a pure devotee like Pallad Maharaj. Well, it's not the case. That would be very traumatic for the kids. Pallad Maharaj was naturally on that stage. No one had to tell him to be on that stage. There weren't even any expectations of him being on that stage. There were the reverse expectations. Why were there reverse expectations? Because Pallad Maharaj was the son of Haranya Kashipu, a big businessman. <laughs> no, I made that up. <laughs> Son of a big, I don't want to say demon because we use that word too much, but a big materialist. And he expected his son to follow in his father's footsteps. And that is, be a big materialist and do the same business his father did. So if someone acts like this, Without being pushed, that's good. But if someone doesn't act like that, don't push them. Don't force Krishna consciousness down their throats. Even if they're 
not a child. Whatever. You don't don't have these expectations about someone that are unrealistic. Expectations are experienced by the person you have the expectations of as like demands, force, and they make someone very uncomfortable. Do not do that. Let someone rise to the level of their own Krishna consciousness and gradually rise more based upon their voluntarily acceptance of Krishna consciousness. That's important for adults, children, men, women, animals, everything. All right. The following statement is about a Brahmin devotee. This Brahmana is very, very expert in all kinds of activities, but I do not know why he is looking up without moving his eyes. It appears that his body is fixed motionless, just like a doll's. I can guess that in this condition, he has been captivated by the transcendental beauty of that expert flute player, Sri Krishna. And being attached to him, he is simply staring at the black cloud, remembering the bodily hue of Sri Krishna. This is an example of how a devotee can become inert due to ecstatic love. And that's just like the bhavas we mentioned before. Remember, the vibhava, things that stimulate your devotion, things that are directly Krishna, not just things, but directly Krishna, alambana, and indirectly, udipana. Okay, udipana would be this cloud in this particular circumstance or a black tree, or anything that's blackish. And then uh, it makes you ecstatic. You just like stare at the cloud. Wow. It's just like Krishna, the color of Krishna. Wow. And as I told the story many times before, I think a long time before in this class, that once upon a time I was at Govardhan, and I, had, I heard the sound of a flute in the distance, and I thought, became stunned, and I thought, oh, I finally heard Krishna. Then I realized there was the loudspeaker system in the place where I was staying, and they were playing some Indian musician with a flute, they were playing a flute. So anyway, but still, it was a stimulation for ecstatic love. In Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th Canto, 4th chapter, verse 40, Vlad Maharaj says that even in his childhood, when he was loudly speaking the glories of the Lord, he used to dance just like a shameless madman. The devotee should learn how to dance. And I was just looking at some uh, videos that I posted of our Mangalarti, and I'm just seeing very few people are dancing. I mean, some people are really dancing, and some people, I'm wondering if they have roots under their feet. And, and sometimes, sorry, being fully absorbed in thought of the pastimes of the Lord, he used to imitate such pastimes. This is an instance of a devotee's being almost like a madman. Similarly, the gopis, actually, I'm not reading this, this is me. Uh, similarly, the gopis, when they were feeling separation from Krishna, would imitate Krishna's pastimes. Some gopis would play the part of the Kaliya serpent, other gopis would play the part of Krishna. Some gopis would play the part of Putana, and other gopis would play the part of Krishna, sucking her life air out. So this is part of exhibiting ecstatic emotions. Similarly, it is said that the great sage Narda was so ecstatically in love with Krishna that he would sometimes dance naked, and sometimes his whole body would become stunned. Sometimes he would laugh very loudly, sometimes he would cry very loudly, and sometimes he would remain silent, and sometimes he would appear to be suffering from some disease although he had no disease. This is another instance of becoming like a madman in the ecstasy of devotion. In the Hari Bhakti Sudhoya, sorry, it is stated that when Pallad Maharaj was thinking himself unfit to approach the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he immersed himself in great distress in an ocean of happy, unhappiness. As such, he used to shed tears and lie down on the floor as though unconscious. The students of a great devotee once talked among themselves in this way. My dear God brothers, our spiritual master, after seeing the lotus feet of the Lord, has thrown himself into the fire of lamentation. And because of this fire, the water of his life has almost dried away. 
Now let us pour the nectar of the holy name through his ears, and by our so doing, or our doing, so the swan of his life may again show signs of life. So this is very similar to what happened with Srila Prabhupada two times. Once when Prabhupada was visiting uh, Atlanta, and another time when Prabhupada was in uh, Caracas, Venezuela. Okay, similar thing. In both temples, there were Gornatai deities. Uh, and when Prabhupada saw the Gornatai deities, uh, in this place that is so far, I remember when devotees heard this so far away, you know, this is the middle of the universe, uh, Atlanta or Caracas. Anyway, uh, and he, he, uh, he began to chant this song. O oh, supremely merciful uh, two brothers, Mochitani and Lord Nichinanda. And he just like went into trance immediately. And there was no external consciousness there. And the devotees didn't know what to do. And in both instances, after some time, they started chanting the holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And the Prabhupada came out to external consciousness. And they asked Prabhupada, what should we do when you go into this uh, frame of consciousness? And Prabhupada, in a very humble way, said, oh, this does not happen very often. So in other words... That's really what happens when something reminds the Lord of, uh, reminds the devotee, sorry, of the Lord's mercy, of the Lord's form, of the Lord's name, then there's ecstasy manifest automatically, and that was a Vyabhachari Baba. So, same thing happened when Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, entered the temple of Lord Jagannath for the first time. He collapsed, and everybody thought this sannyasi has left his body. And only by putting a cotton swab by the nose of Lord Chaitanya did uh, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, this great devotee, ascertain that this sannyasi was still alive. And they brought him back to Sarvabhama Bhattacharya's house. And when the devotees started chanting Hare Krishna, he came back to external consciousness. So that's what you need to do when a devotee leaves his external consciousness. Okay. Remember that. Of course, you're fortunate if you're with a great devotee like that who leaves external consciousness and you get a chance to chant for him. You are very fortunate. When Lord Krishna went to the city of Shanitapura to fight with Bali Maharaj's son, Bana, and to cut off all his hands, he actually left him with four hands. Uddhava, being separated from Krishna and thinking of his fight, was almost completely stunned into unconsciousness. So... Uh, this is a very interesting story about, I think we can tell the story, since many of you don't know the story. We'll uh, tell it in an abbreviated uh, fashion. So, uh, Bali, uh, anyway, so Banasura, <coughs> or Bana, as it is called here, uh, had a, a beautiful daughter. Her name was Usha. And she had a dream, and in that dream, she actually saw Krishna's grandson, Aniruddha, and she arranged for him to be kidnapped and brought to her house. And her father, Bana, didn't know about it. Finally, her father discovers her with him and then captures Aniruddha, and then Krishna has to come and, uh, and fight with Banasura. And Banasura had like a thousand arms, and Krishna had to cut them all off except for four. And the reason... He actually didn't kill Banasura, was because Banasura was a descendant of Pallad Maharaj. Pallad Maharaj's son was Virochan, Virocha's son was Bali, Bali's son was Banasura. So, uh, because Lord Nishingadev, when he killed Haranya Kashipu, who was the father of Pallad Maharaj, okay, here's the family tree. Pallad Maharaj, you know, family tree is Haranya Kashipu, Pallad Maharaj, uh, Virochan, uh, Bali and Bana. Okay, you got it. Interesting family tree. 
So, uh, so anyway, so Nishingadev, Nishinga Bhagavan, he uh, blessed Pallad Maharaj by saying, in addition to many other things, that I will never kill any of your descendants. And that's one reason why Krishna did not kill Banasura. Another reason why Krishna did not kill Banasura was because Banasura was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva was trying to protect him from Krishna's wrath, but Lord Shiva was unable to protect him from Krishna's wrath. But because Lord Shiva is the greatest devotee of Lord Krishna, Krishna agreed not to kill Banasura and agreed just to leave him with four hands. And so then... Usha, the daughter of Banasura, and Nani Ruta, the grandson of Krishna, got married and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> when a devotee is fully in love with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, there may be the following symptoms due to his feelings of separation from the Lord. A feverish condition of the body, withering of the body, lack of sleep, non-attachment, inertness, appearing disease, madness, unconsciousness, and sometimes death. As far as the feverish condition of the body is concerned, Uddhava once told Narada, my dear great sage, the lotus flower that is a friend of the sun may be a burning sensation and indivora. Thus, in various ways, we do not mind. But the most regrettable factor is that all of them remind us of Krishna, and this is giving us too much distress. This is an instance of the feverish condition which is due to being separated from Krishna. In other words, those who are actually in intense love for Krishna, when they're not with Krishna and something reminds them of Krishna, it causes them so much pain, just like a lover who is separated from his or her beloved. Something reminds them of a picture. They look at the wall of their house and they see there's a picture of dear, sweet uh, Petunia giving the lady a name and they go oh Petunia I haven't seen you or like a sailor or a soldier who's overseas and he keeps the pictures of his wife and his family in front of him and he looks at them and he starts crying out of separation so so much more is the feeling is the intensity of separation the devotee feels for Krishna, when he's reminded of Krishna. Some of the devotees who went to see Krishna at Dwarka and were detained at the door said, My dear Krishna, O friend of the Pandus, as the swan loves to dive in the water among the lily flowers and would die if taken from the water, we, uh, so we wish only to be with you. Our limbs are shrinking and fading because you have been taken away from us. The king of Bahula, Although very comfortably situated in his palace, began to think the night's very long and distressing because of his separation from Krishna. King Yudhisthira once said, Krishna, the chariot driver of Arjuna, is the only relative of mine within the three worlds. Therefore, my mind is becoming maddened day and night with separation from his lotus feet. And I do not know how to situate myself or where I shall go to attain any steadiness of mind. This is another example of lack of sleep due to separation from Krishna, not just lack of sleep because you have some disease. Some of the coward friends of Krishna said, my dear Krishna, O enemy of the Mora demon, just think of your personal servant, Raktaka. Simply because he saw a peacock feather, that's a Vibhava, he is now closing his eyes and is no longer attentive to pasturing the cows. Rather, he has left them in a faraway pasture and has not even bothered to use his stick to control them. This is an instance of mental imbalance due to separation from Krishna, and he's reminded by the peacock feather. Let me see how much more we have in this chapter, see if we can finish it. Hold on a second. Detail. Let's see. Uh... Let's see. Oh, no. Uh, we're almost finished. Let's finish this chapter. Uh, when Lord Krishna went uh, to the capital of King Yudhisthira, Uddhava was so afflicted by the fire of separation from Sri Krishna that the perspiration from his inflamed body and the tears from his eyes poured from him, and in this way he became completely stunned. When Sri Krishna left the city of Dwarka to seek out 
The Shimon took a jewel and he was late returning home. Udava became so afflicted that the symptoms of disease became manifest on his body. Actually, due to his excessive ecstatic love for Krishna, Udava became known in Dwarka as crazy. To his great fortune on that day, Udava's reputation as a crazy fellow was firmly established. Udava's craziness was practically proved when he went to arrive at Taka Hill to minutely observe the congested black clouds. In his disturbed condition, he began to pray to these clouds, and he expressed his jubilation in bowing down before them. This is great love. Uddhava informed Krishna, my dear leader of the Yadu dynasty, your servants in Vrindavan cannot sleep at night thinking of you. So now they are all lying down on the bank of the Yamuna, almost paralyzed. And it appears that they are almost dead because their breathing is very slow. This is an instance of becoming unconscious due to separation from Krishna. Krishna was once informed, you are the life and soul of all the inhabitants of Vrindavan, so because you have left Vrindavan, all the servitors of your lotus feet there are suffering. It is, is, no, it is as if the lakes filled with lotus flowers have dried up from the scorching heat of separation from you. In the example given here, the inhabitants of Vrindavan are compared to lakes filled with lotus flowers. And because of the scorching heat of separation from Krishna, the lakes, along with the lotus flowers of their lives, are being burned up. And the swans in the lakes, who are compared to the vitality of the inhabitants of Vrindavan, are no longer desiring to live there. In other words, because of the scorching heat, the swans are leaving the lakes. This metaphor is used to describe the condition of the devotees separated from Krishna. And so we're going to end here. And of course, now we're talking about separation, like Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Separation, a moment is like 12 years or more. I am feeling all vacant in the world on account of your separation. O oh, Govinda. Yugayitam nimichena chakshusha pravashayitam shunyayitam jagatsarvam. Govinda vidahena me. Okay. Who wants to ask a question? Nobody wants to ask a question. Shruti Which one? Yeah, Shruti Priya. Hi, I have a question. May I ask it? Yes. Okay. So, um, sorry. Um, what is like? What does it say to Krishna when we don't go to him? when we're in some type of distress or like when we have a problem, what does it say when we don't chant or go to him? It says, we are in Maya. <laughs> what does it say? You go to big Maya. If you don't go to him. You are a rascal. But Krishna feels sorry for you. He feels compassion. He thinks this rascal. Why does this turn? And then Krishna will, Krishna will rain, keep arranging difficulties so that we eventually turn to him. He says Krishna, Krishna thinks, I guess this rascal needs more, more lessons. So Krishna will send more lessons. Okay. So watch out. If you don't pass the test, you get it again and again and again and again and again until you pass. It's like in school, you don't graduate until you pass the test. And you have to keep taking it over. You can repeat fourth grade a thousand times. So don't repeat. Okay, who else has a question? This is your opportunity to ask a question. Okay, Narayani has a question. I see it in the chat window, and it's for everybody can see. Okay, okay. Uh, you want to ask your question in the chat window, Narayani, or out loud? I'll, I'll talk. Hare Krishna, Guru Dev. Please accept my humble obeisances. My blessings. Okay. Um, regarding like you were saying about Prahlad Maharaj and how some parents consider their kids as Prahlad Maharaj and 
like you know they try to push the kids to an extent yeah um i think um that's right as well but uh, also uh you know some uh, parents say they just don't want to do anything like even for advising their kids to chant just one round mal and they would say oh i don't want to push the kid because it has to come from themselves um <laughs> in that matter i think uh, it's just like uh, you say about pulling and pushing like when they're small if you start like uh, planting the seed like little by little isn't it good they get attracted and they start chanting it just builds it's the parents responsibility is it or like yeah i mean there's, there's a happy medium there's a happy medium between forcing and not doing that anything but you can you know you can encourage the ch children to chant but it shouldn't be like either you chant or you fast you yeah. don't want to do that yeah uh, like uh, not like that yeah totally some some parents because uh, like uh, how the higher authorities sometimes like some gurus as well like say okay don't force them to chant let it come from inside but how will it come from inside unless you advise or encourage them about the importance yeah. of chanting Everything. Yeah, yeah. You you should invite. You could advise them, encourage them, but don't take a belt to them. <laughs> yeah, um, normally I've seen like you know with the three kids, uh, like I go, as you know, like it never happened like with the belt or anything like. But they love <laughs> to do it. Like this love, like you know, they start for uh, forming that uh, love and yeah, both, you... both, like. Uh, don't push it's like uh, not pushing them too much but uh, yeah just giving them little bit doses so it like when they are standing like you know how i mean like the material life i mean when they are standing at the point it does help them when they have that little bit of spiritual in them like it does help them fight this yes i i agree <laughs> i agree so yeah they have to be encouraged and asked to do things uh like but if they want to, if let's say if the child wants to play or something like that, you don't. Yeah, tell recent, them the, you don't recent, tell them their nonsense and force them not to play. <laughs> yeah, recently, recently I saw one article that was like a very well known Prabhu who does the initiation and everything. So there was a little kid. I think he does. He saying he was asking him a question, and saying I do a lot of. Uh, devotion and everything but i'm not really attracted to material things but my parents want me to follow normal life as a child and they tell me to watch uh, tv for a bit so i just watch 15 minutes uh, a day or like twice a week or something like that and so that person was telling him oh you shouldn't watch tv at all you should just reach read krishna book so i think that, that's what is called extreme like yeah, that's extreme. The whole point is not to be extreme in either way. Yeah. You don't want to keep Krishna consciousness from the kids, but you don't want to torture the poor kids into becoming Krishna conscious. It's like a, sometimes I would use the, a joke, like in uh, in America they have these Western movies, which maybe nobody has seen, the cowboys and American Indians, and the uh, cowboy would come in and take his gun out and pointed at people's feet and said, and he would say, dance partner, and he would actually shoot bullets at someone's feet and they would be made to dance. Oh. So with the children, we shouldn't be like that because we don't shoot bullets. We, <laughs> could, we shouldn't say, either you dance in RT or you're gonna get a spanking when you get home or you're not gonna get a sweet ball unless you dance. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's like training animals yeah <laughs> yeah and then they start getting away yeah and that's true as well yeah then they start get, getting tricky and then uh a little cheeky and everything like that yeah. so yes there's a happy medium between forcing and not doing anything so yeah there's a balance okay yeah. thank Good you Guru Dev. thank you narayani so who else has a question mine Hare Krishna, okay. Guru Dev, Sandra Pranam. Please take some respect for me since it's all Krishna Shila from Bad. Well, how did your parents bring you up? 
<laughs> they didn't force me at all. They didn't force you at all. I forced you. <laughs> um, Guru Dev, I had a question. Yeah. Why is Mayapur called Mayapur? Because don't we associate Maya like in a negative way, like kind of connotated in a negative way? No, Maya can mean many different things. It can mean energy. It could mean mm -hmm. mercy. Mm -hmm. So in this particular context, you can take Mayapur as being Odarya Dam, which means the merciful place. Mm -hmm. You know, like Krishna has his Yoga Maya, he has his Maha Maya. Yoga Maya is the internal potency of the Lord. Uh, Maha Maya is the external potency. It simply means energy. So really, when we say someone is un in Maya, that means basically they're in Krishna's energy, which is always true anyway. But in the context, it usually means an illusion. Mm -hmm. But the word literally means energy. Yoga Maya uh, or Maha Maya. So it's not a bad word, Mayapur, the place of mercy. Okay, thank right. you. Thank you, Rudev. Uh, Vrindavan is known as uh, Madhurya Dam, that means the sweet place. And Mayapur is known as Odarya Dam, which means the merciful place. Madhurya and Odarya, okay. So Maya's all right, but don't be in Maya. <laughs> Thank you, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Become a doctor. <laughs> All right. So who else has a question there? Okay. I'm still waiting the results for that, Gurudev. We'll get it today sometime. You're going to hear it today. Let me know. Send me a text or something as soon as you get yes, it. Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so we have a... Uh, Someone, uh, Kiur, uh, you asked a question. I have one question. You can ask a question if you want. Hare Krishna. Right. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, uh, humble obeisances to you. Very, very nice to hear your class. Thank uh, you. Yeah, we have been going through the different emotions of uh, ecstatic love. So I was just wondering where in this Kali Yuga or in this material world where it is very, very rare to find even a true love in the relationship as well. So right. how, how can we develop such a uh, aesthetic love for Krishna where we have like, you know, we know that it is in our heart. It is sitting uh, there. It is just that we have to unwind it. But how can we develop that kind of a relationship, aesthetic love, which we have been going to the, with the different devotees like Uddhava, gopis, and all? You know what? What? How we? How we should approach that level? That's a very good question. Well, right now, because our and Arthas, uh, Krishna's name. That's why we have the Hare Krishna mantra. In the uh, first verse of the Shikshashika, which is actually written by Lord Chaitanya, Cheto uh, Darpana Marjanam Bhava Mahadvagni Nirvapana, it's described by the chanting, we cleanse these things away. The reason we don't experience you know, true love or any of these things in this world is because we have these impurities that are covered, that are actually connected with our subtle body, the Linga Shavira. Uh, that is the mental body or the astral body, whatever you may call it. There's different nomenclature. So these impurities can be dissolved by the chanting of Krishna's names because Krishna is non-different from his name. And uh, what is it? Om Pavitra Pavitra Va Sarva Vashtam Gatopi Va Yaksmarek Pundarikaksham Savaya Avyantara Chuchi Sri Vishnu Sri Vishnu. And one who chants the name whatever the background of that person is, those impurities are eradicated and one can rise to the proper platform. Of course, in addition to chanting the rounds, chanting the name is the most important, but in addition to that, there are other practices too, such as seeing the form of the deity, such as offering all your food to Krishna, 
that help purify the heart. Because without having a purified heart, there's no question of having any pure relationships, either in this world or with Krishna. So when we're reading about all these ecstatic expressions of love, these are pure personalities who are exhibiting this. I'm not suggesting right now that we can experience or exhibit these qualities, but we can in the future if we continue with the process of Krishna consciousness, specifically pleasing Srila Prabhupada, we get the kripa or the mercy from Srila Prabhupada, and then one day you'll come to that platform. We all will come to that platform. Good question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Babuji. And, and, and one more, if you, if you don't mind, please. Yes. Sorry about that. So, Babuji, according to you, which one we should read first? Bhagavatam ya Chaitanya Charitamut? I think the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita, uh, Nectar Devotion, Bhagavatam, uh, Bhagavatam before Chaitanya Charitamrita. But of course, what I suggest is generally the people can read the Bhagavatam and the Chaitanya Charitamrita simultaneously. That doesn't mean at the same time. That means like they'll do a half hour reading of Bhagavatam, half hour reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita. So I think it's good to divide up your reading. It's not that it's not that one is prohibited from reading the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It's more advanced, but at the same time, it will help one understand the Bhagavatam, and then also the Bhagavatam will help one understand the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Okay, so, so they, are, they are not dependent, like once you understand that, you can understand this one better. It's not like that. Well, uh, both, are, both are actually interconnected, I would say. Mm -hmm. You know, to understand the uh, Bhagavatam, it's important to have an understanding of Lord Chaitanya. And in order to understand Lord Chaitanya, it's important to have an understanding of, you know, Bhagavatam, basic philosophy of Bhagavatam. But I would sure. start Bhagavatam, of course, in the first canto, gradually work your way up. The Chaitanya Charitamrita, however, you can pick any section of the Chaitanya Charitamrita. It doesn't have to be read uh, in the same order as the chapters. You can actually skip around in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Although, beginning in the beginning is good because it has the most philosophical chapters in the what's called the Adi Leela, or the beginning of the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, for asking, thank you for asking nice questions. All right, and before we end, I just want to make an announcement. Tomorrow, we're going to start a half an hour early. That's just tomorrow, not any other day. Half hour earlier, and instead of the class, we're going to have an ecstatic dance performance. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's not me dancing, so don't worry about it. An ecstatic dance performance uh, of the Lalita Madhava. We have a whole group here. It's in English, and you'll see it. It's very wonderful. It's going to be done once tomorrow and once the next day. But tomorrow's performance is going to be in the temple room, and it's going to be an ideal time for those in Australia, New Zealand, and Fiji to watch. And that's a half an hour earlier than today, than our normal time. And after that, we go back to our normal time. And the day, the day after that, which, at least here the day after tomorrow, is Diwali. For those of you in Australia and New Zealand, it's probably Diwali is tomorrow. I'm not sure which day it is where you are. But uh, so anyway, it's a Diwali. It's sort of a Diwali dance in honor of Diwali. And so then we'll also be speaking about Diwali on Diwali Day uh, and also the next. Uh, go for dog. Week, we have Prabhupada's uh, Disappearance Day commemoration. So we have all these different things coming up. But every other day it will be at the same time we normally do. It's only tomorrow. It's going to be a half an hour earlier. Okay, thank you very much. We'll see everybody tomorrow. All glories to his divine grace. Shila Prabhupada, Shila Prabhupada, Ki Jai.